Professor Emeritus, the Honorable Errol Miller. He is a professor of teacher education at the Institution of Education of the University of the West Indies, Mona, since 2006. He is an educator. He's a former principal of the Michael University. He's a past president of the Jamaica Teachers Association. He is a public servant and he is in the context of today. But most of all, we have to celebrate the past in terms of the God who put us here, who enables us, who has given each one of us, every single one of us, is here not because of any accident, but because of the design of God, who gave us a purpose, who has a plan in his scheme of things. And we must understand it that way. And I'm going to speak of James Marcel Filippo in those terms. As a man who answered the call of God in his time. And I hope that by telling you what happened to him, he would never have dreamt that this sanctuary would be named Filippo. When he died, he wouldn't have known that. When he died, it was the First Baptist Church. And you know the, the battle of the Baptists. But God worked it out. So that Reverend Carter Henry, in 1947, uniting the Second Baptist Church, what that came out of the break of the battle of the Baptists and First Baptists have come together and united, reaching back. And let us give praise to Reverend Carter Henry. He understood that the only thing that could unite it was the source from which it sprang, Filippo himself. That is the working of God. We sometimes believe that we are not significant, that we are not important, that what we do don't matter. We develop all kinds of cynical statements, and I use some of them sometimes, about us being forgiven and forgotten and not remembered. In fact, I often make the joke that I have done a lot of things, but one gift I have is the gift of leaving. And when I have left it, I left it to those who come after, for them to do what they want with it. If they ask me, I will give everything I know, but I don't give advice where I'm not asked. Because if people are running things, they are running it under, hopefully, the inspiration of God. And if they're not doing that, they're going to find out. So we must not live our lives just in the moment and not recognizing God, who is God Almighty, God of all of us. Let me just say this to you. This ran through Philippa's life. Let me tell you who James Philippa was to begin with. Let me start there. Philippa the person. Because without Philippa the person, you will not understand him in relationship to his God and what he did. James Philippa was the eldest listen carefully, surviving son of his parents. Four of them survived. We don't have the record of how many of them Peter and Sarah Philippo had. But he was the eldest surviving son. His father was a master builder. <laughs> and he was part owner of an iron foundry in East Berryham in Norfolk, US, uh, uh, England. The name Philippa don't sound English, does it? It is not. Because the Philippos migrated to England, or should, I should have said fled to England in about 
1575-1580 at a time of part of the dark side of the Reformation. You know, we always celebrate these things as if they were such great events and don't see the things that occurred afterwards. And this happened when Catholics and Calvinists and Lutherans and Huguenots were fighting wars and committing savages, savageries and cruelties that bear no relationship to the name of God. And they fled. And they went to England and they joined the Anglican Church. So he was christened and confirmed Anglican. Born 14th of February, 1798. Christened and confirmed Anglican. But he was precocious, as I told you. He had a good memory. And he could recite things, and he liked to imitate persons. So he would listen to a sermon and then recite it to the, to the, to the great joy of those around him. In fact, one of them said, one of these days you're going to become a, Mason, a Methodist person. That was at age four, so they sent him to school. In those days, you didn't go to school till you were seven. They sent him to, a, to be a day student of a boarding school in East Derryham. He was precocious. So when he came to seven, they sent him to a small elementary school run by a Baptist church <laughs> in East Derryham. But because he was so precocious, all he did was to give trouble and get into mischief because he had already passed that. So they didn't hold him there very long. They sent him to the next town, to a grammar school. I think you... That's another name for a high school. Not too sure what age he was. But that school had a very stern and severe graduate of Cambridge University. And he administered to the sons, his sons and his, his, his students. He had 50 students in the school at the time. And he was severe with all of them. In fact, Philip Burry counts that at one time he decided to beat every boy in the school. And when he reached the senior boys, they rebelled and wrestled him to the ground, <laughs> which was sort of unheard of <laughs> in those times. He made no discrimination between his sons and the boys, but he was severe. So, having learned everything that he could learn, he left school at age about 13, 14. Now, his parents were very strict. So, after work, working with his father for a little while, he went to a neighboring town where his grandfather was living and lived and worked with his grandfather. And I think you know, grandparents tend not to be as strict as parents. Um, I have heard, you know the joke, that some people say if they know grandchildren were, were so nice, they would have started with them. <laughs> I... I, I um, I tell my daughter, as you said, she's, she's young. I tell her I've had two experiences of parenting, and I'm a granny daddy. <laughs> because I sort of indulge her. The, plus, she's my only daughter. You understand her? <laughs> so I, I take full responsibility. M Mom is not agreeing uh, with, with to daughter. But let's, let, you understand what I'm saying. So very shortly after that, he got into company, and uh, you must know the language of the times, respectable company, but irreligious. 
You understand that what I mean? You know what that means. You know, everybody knows that their children go astray, not because of their children, but bad company. They are never the bad company. Okay. Now, here, here is the joke. I want you to, I, I, and I'm going to read this because you must understand how the times change. Listen to some of the things that was bad company. He started to go to tea gardens, bowling greens, club feasts, country wakes, the theater. <laughs> Stop going to church. But here is where the other part now. Start disturbing, disturbing the services of a small Methodist church in that community and start jeering people going to church. Well, now you know it. He has, he has really gone off. Teenage rebellion. However, a few near death experiences afflicted him. One, he was saved from drowning. That was pretty frightening. Then he dropped from a crane about 30 feet up. And then he was thrown from a horse that was frightened. And all, any one of those experiences, he could have died. So something suggested to him that look here the next time I could. So he went back and found the pastor of the Baptist church that he used to go to. And out of that, he came to a conversion experience in which he gave his life to the Lord. Now, he also left his grandfather's house and apprenticed himself. You know, in those days, apprenticeship, you go to a master, whatever it is, and you are an apprentice. And that master got ill, very ill. And Philippa was so faithful to his work in carrying on his work, although his master was ill, and so, faith, and so caring in taking care of his master, that when the master recovered, he said to Philippo, I don't know what I will do if I lose you, but have you ever thought that you should go into the ministry, into the Christian ministry? It, it put, a, it put a, a thought into Philippo's mind. His, his care and his faithfulness showed a piety that said, look, your occupation may be there. And he thought about it. And at 19 years old, he decided, yes. But more than that, I want to be a missionary. Because his desire was to go and take the gospel to heathen, anywhere in the world. He wasn't particular. And so he went back to his Baptist pastor and and in those days, you have, to be, you, 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 you have to be a candidate to go to college. These the education system has changed. It is a sort of preceptor thing where you go and get preparation. So he went and was, went with a number of about five or six students of the similar kind to be prepared now to be able to go to theological school. And there, he met another student called James Mercer. <laughs> now, remember, he was christened James Philippo. But he met James Mercer. James Mercer was one year younger than he, but in part of the whole preceptor program and thing, they had to go and preach in neighboring villages. And Marcel had the ability to translate the gospel 
into the language and experience of the villagers. And Filippo admired this gift greatly. On the other hand, Marcel was very impressed with Filippo's piety and single-mindedness in what he wanted to do. So they became good friends. And as mark of the friendship, they decided to put each other's middle names, surnames, as their middle names. So he became James Marcel Filippo, and James Marcel became James Filippo Marcel. <laughs> I hope you hear that. But James Merce, Philippo Mercel was being trained to be a, a minister at home. Philippo wanted to be a missionary. So they parted, but they remained friends for life. That's how Philippo becomes James Mercer. Now, I also have to point out this out to you, that when he applied to the Baptist Missionary Society, it took about nine months before they gave him an answer. And eventually they called him. And when he went into the room to be interviewed in London, because he's, he meets Another person who is also being interviewed. And who was that? Thomas Birchell. <laughs> so he meets Thomas Birchell at the same time, and both of them got accepted. So his preparation to become a missionary took six years. Because he goes, while, while, while Birchell goes to Bristol, he goes to Bradford. And they separate. I make this little thing. Now, when he comes, 1823, you know that date? 1823 is when Philippa arrives in Jamaica to come to this church. Here is the joke. It was a momentous year. Number one, when they called him, they said, we are going to send you to Jamaica. He was willing to go anywhere in the world to bring the gospel to the heathen. They said, Jamaica. He gets ordained. <laughs> and at his ordination service, you would love to read it. At some stage, his tutor, his classical tutor, examines him and asks him three questions. Will you give us an account of your conversion? <laughs> you, you have been to ordination to the Baptist Church? You know they examine you? And will you tell us what has impelled you to enter upon this enterprise? <laughs> and then he's given the charge. He answers the three questions, and he's given the charge. Let, and the charge is this. Let me tell you something. Understand this. You have taken on the responsibility to be a missionary and a, pa a reverend and a pastor. Let me let you understand. There is no creed. There is no race. There is no class. There is no country. All are one. In Christ Jesus. Don't tell me about race. Don't tell me about class. They didn't call it class in those days. They call it station in life. And that message to him is this. If you're going to be a missionary, forget all this business of race and class and age and nationality. Because what? God is God of all. That is his charge. 
in addition to being ordained, thank you, in addition to being ordained, Philip gets married. He had met his lady while he was in marriage, and he's now ordained, he's going to a post. So they get married, and he arrives in Jamaica after a long while, all in 1823. And let me just make, it a, little, make a little connection here. And he arrives in Moran Point. <laughs> he takes a boat, and it brings them to Port Royal. And the next day, he goes from Port Royal to Kingston, and it's a Sunday. And the first place he goes to is East Queen Street Baptist Church. Look at this building. Go to East Queen Street, and you will see. He had been preaching to, to tens and hundreds in all villages for six years because he had given up all other responsibilities. He suddenly arrives, and to get into the church, he has to press because it's thousands he's now dealing with. By the way, East Queen Street Baptist Chapel was, op was opened in 1822, and its membership was 2,954, one of the largest Baptist churches in the world. You understand that? He's accustomed to, uh, to small things. He has suddenly arrived in a big thing. Why? Because 40 years before, in 1783, George Lyle and the African Americans um, bring back the Baptist denomination to Jamaica. And in that 40 years, it thrives, especially in Kingston and in Spanish town. Because when he comes here, he finds a church that was built for 250, but it can't hold nobody. The people are all over the clothes. So when you look at the similarity, it's because that is what he first met. And if you, if you go around in Baptist circles, you know, East Queen Street, Philip, this sanctuary, and St. Anne's Bay, built the same way. I tell you one thing more. He meets on that morning. He meets Thomas Nib. That is William's Nib's brother. Because William Nib's brother had come to be a teacher in the school at East Queen Street, which was then one of the largest schools in the country with over 700 students. And William Neve preached in the morning because the pastor, Reverend Coulthard, was away. And Joshua Tinson preached in the evening, and they preached to monster congregations. We don't, I, I hope you hear what I've just said. We believe that Christianity was brought and the Baptist denomination brought by white men to subjugate us. And we forget that our roots are in African-American Baptists. And they did a great job. What, no, why did the English Baptists come? Because, you see, in 1802, the most powerful oligarch in Jamaica, his name was Simon Taylor, Listen to what he was. He was Custos of St. Thomas in the East, chief magistrate in St. Thomas of the, in the East. He was chief justice <laughs> of the, as I, he was a member of the assembly. He held every, and he was the third richest man in the British Empire. <laughs> and the, he decided that these nonconformists have to shut them down. They must have to stop preaching. 
and preaching included singing and praying. And he did on the day. Look how powerful this guy was. He got the House of Assembly located where? In Spanish Town, because Spanish Town is the capital. He got them, if you know parliamentary procedure, you have a first reading. And then you have a second reading. And then you have a third reading. And it goes to the Legislative Council. And it's passed. And then it's signed. He got that all done in two days. That's how powerful he was. You ever hear about oligarchs? You know what an oligarch is? It entertain every position. I'm just going to make this other point, just moving on. Until 1962, Jamaica was always run by oligarchs. Remember that? White Creole oligarch, multiracial oligarch, British officials as oligarchs. This is the first time we are living in a democracy. I, um, now, Philippa's great blessing in life was he had a rugged constitution and he was blessed with long life. You know that there is no blessing you have, no strength you have that has a, not have a corresponding vein, a corresponding disadvantage. They come that way. They come in twins. You never get something for nothing. All of those people who want everything and something for nothing, you misguided. So you know what was Philippa's being? His own death, near-death experience brought him to the Lord. And right throughout his life, he had to deal with burying. He, Mrs. Philippa was six years older than, than him. So as soon as they arrived in Jamaica, they got down to business. And by 18, he arrives in 1823, by about 1827, they have had three children, all dead in their infancy. At the same time, he's building this chapel. And when it opens its seats, 15 to 1,600 and 1,000 and more than that outside. So he has the blessing of the new chapel and he has the difficulty. Do you understand what it is to bury your first three children. Don't only think of, don't only think of him. Think of her. And don't believe that pastors are just there to, 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 to give care to their, their congregations, their, care, their country, country, uh, congregations, give back cheer to them. And one of the things that, that Philippa kept was a note he got from the church. You see, the sanctuary is the building, but the church are those who have given themselves to the Lord. And they said to him, Pastor, isn't it you who tell us that no matter what happened to us, we must believe in God and we mustn't lose hope. Don't lose hope, Pastor. He says, think about it. What would happen if God took Mrs. and left you with the baby? Philippa took strength. From the time he decided to become a missionary, 19, about 19, by 20 something, he started to keep a diary. And he kept that diary right up to almost the time of his death. So we have some insights. Let me give you one or two things about Philippo. And I am going to stop here because I see the time is running fast. I'm going to stop very shortly. 
when Philippa was about 58, he went to England. Only one of his brothers, his younger brothers, was still alive. And he went to where he came from to visit them. And he told them that he has decided to make Spanish town his grave. You see, when we went over there today and put a wreath, Philippa says, I've left you. Jamaica and Spanish town in particular is where I have chosen. The Lord has placed me there. I've stayed there and I'll leave him there until I die. Let me tell you something. Jamaica has been built by people from wherever they were born who have come here and say, this is my home. We might fight among each other and have differences, but we have chosen Jamaica. I saw recently where it is said that Jamaica is not on the list of a, a number of countries who can go now to Big Broad and don't need no visa. I, I still go to the same barber. You know, I, I have a little quirk in that regard. I, 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 I can't deal with a whole heap of different. I go to the same barber, the same church. That's, that's just me. Boring. But listen. When I went there last, earlier in, 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 in June, there was a conversation about this. And, 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 and everybody was giving their opinion. So I wait until the main people were there, and there was one left. And I asked the people who were left, have you ever heard about Carl Stone? I said, no, we never hear about Carl Stone. <laughs> no, this is history for, for them. But I say, you remember, you know, Carl Stone did a poll. And he found that 62% of Jamaicans would migrate if given the opportunity. 35% would not. Because they had been. I believe that the policy for that is to send everybody, give everybody a ticket to go. Because when they go and find out, they come back and be more contented and constructive here. I am not saying that those who decide to make Jamaica home, don't have, we don't have our own fights and difficulties, but this is home. Let me say a couple of other things. Philippa, when he started here, the first thing he did was to build a school, not metropolitan, <laughs> a school built on what he called the Lancastrian system. And he, he established a grammar school in Spanish town. Now, he also had Beckford and Smith. But the school that he organized attracted a whole set of people from Spanish town of whatever class and ethnicity. It attracted a lot of Jews, colored people, some white people, some black people. And here's what Philip would do. The, the fees that was charged for that school, Philip opened an elementary school for free, paid by the fees from... Are, are, you, are you hearing me? And that was whether you're free or you're enslaved. Yes. So Philippa develops yes. a thing where he sees the need and he's taking practical steps to address it. And he's not doing it in any sectarian and racist or anything. And the people respond to it. Philippo became the bot because if there is anything Philippo was against, it was slavery. So Philippo becomes the representative of the people at the center of planter power. I hope you hear me. 
and they treated him like a dog. And he responded, not like a dog. But he said, you can treat me that way, but I will get around you in dealing with practical things that help the people. I just gave you one example. So when it comes that slavery is going to be, and you know all of that history, I'm giving you a little thing here. When it comes that slavery is going to be abolished, Philip said to himself, you think those people are going to now treat the former slaves in any good way? Not on your life. So Philip becomes the architect, and you know that scheme. He becomes the architect. He and a number of Quakers and others are buying property. Now, the planters wouldn't sell them the property if they knew what he was going to do. So he got agents <laughs> to buy the properties anonymously. <laughs> and when he bought the properties, knowing that through their provision ground and enterprise and artisan trades, people had money, they would buy. He was one of the architects of what we now call the free village. Now come back to Kitchen Talk. We go over there today. We put the grave, the, 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 the wreath on Philippa's grave. His wife is there. But the, the tomb of his youngest son that had survived. Because of the, of the nine, only four survived. He has the, the grave over there of his youngest son. And you know what the middle name, his name is Edwin, but you know what the middle name is? Kitson. <laughs> and one of the places, there are a couple of places that Philip, he, he, passed, he had a strong constitution, he go all over the place. But Sligoville, this church, Passage Fort, no. Portmore and Kitsenton. Now, I'm not telling you that um, Philippo didn't have any attitude in it. He did. And one of the things that galled him to the core was that George Gibb had done work in Jericho. And at this, and, 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 and uh, <laughs> Listen to this now, it got compounded. A slave woman had land, and she gave the land to, to build a church, a chapel. Now, by that time, she is an apprentice. And although you could inherit property as a slave, you didn't have any title. So, this member of the House of Assembly and big wig in the parish, when he had brought the lumber to build the chapel, the guy come and take the lumber and extend his own house and laugh after them and say, do what you want about it. Let me tell you something. That girl, Filippo, he never stopped repeating that injustice. But you know what happened? After emancipation, that same man goes to England and comes back, having accepted the Lord. And Philip was happy that having come back and accepted the Lord, he gave them back the lumber. And he joined the church. And he, and he thanked God for the enemies. In other words, he was not against the planters for being planters. He was against them because they were selfish and greedy and corrupt and immoral. Are you? You know that it? You must hate the sin, but not the sinner. That was Philip. There was one time that Philip was sided with the planters one time in his life that he argued a case 
for the planters. And it was after the Sugar Duties Act in 1844, when the British government instituted free trade and allowed free labor to compete with slave labor. And Philippa's point was this, you got to be kidding. The British government is now going to let in sugar produced by slave labor in preference to sugar produced by free labor. Because all you're doing is hurting the people. His view was you can't hurt, you can't hurt the guy who is doing it and not hurt also, because most times those policies hurt poor people. He says what is needed is a, is a fair thing. This is a day's pay, and a day's pay will allow you to live a decent life. And such, and such a, a, a principle had been developed for free people, and they, but they were not prepared to do it for the slave. Are you? Philip was like that. He was pious, he was patient, but he had, some, he had some views that he would not compromise. I'm going to, as I said, I, I see the time going, so I'm going to take one last example. And I'm going to come back to the Baptist battle. You see, Philip had built the sanctuary. He had established the school. And I see some of the things you write in your history when you celebrated the 200th anniversary. It needs a little adjustment. And I'm telling you this because um, the reason I'm talking like this and without even anything is because I, I, over the last six years, I've written two books about elections and governance in Jamaica. Not in a narrow sense, but in a wider sense. And because of that, and the part of the Baptist played, I've had to look at it. Now, the one, it's, it's from 1663 to 1962, the colonial years, and 1962 to the present, the independence years. The independence years has come out already. The other one is coming out next month. But here, 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 here the point. You see, when you have elections, and you record here that most of the people voted for Dawson. <laughs> most of the people attended. But it wasn't most of the people. <laughs> most of the people went, stayed with Philippo. <laughs> and Philippo moved over to the school building, which was big enough to take 12 to 1,500 in three rooms and had the church over there. But you see, what happened was, Philippo was always challenged with health issues. Not because he had a weak constitution, but because of the expansion of what took place after, after in, he was talking so much everywhere without any microphone, that he lost his voice. And he was told that if he continued, he would lose it altogether. So he went back to England in, in, in 1842, 43. And he was told he must not, 1842, he must not, he must stop all speaking. Because if he, he would lose the voice. But Philippa was not know, known to be a man who could do nothing. So he couldn't speak, but you know what he did? He wrote. <laughs> and he wrote the very well-known book, Jamaica and so on, 1843. And he published that, and it was sold out. It had three editions before you know what. Now, while he, he had left the church with Dawson, and when he came back and find that Reverend Dawson had, um, and some of the members had sort of not stayed with him. That, of all the things that Philippa had to deal with in his life, that hurt him to his core. His diary records the years of the court case, 1844 to 1851, as the darkest days of his life. He spoke about going up into the pulpit to preach and doing so without unction. 
He spoke about not being able to sleep. He spoke about going down on his knees to pray and can't pray. He was depressed. You know, some of the hardest experience in life is not with quarreling with people outside of you. It's with your own inside. And it doesn't matter whether they're a church, a political party, a club, a family, or whatever. Those are the most hurtful. And when the case is, <laughs> when the case is finally resolved, you know, the, the, the judgment is in favor. But you know, you know us already. Some people decided to, they, they don't win the course case, so they're going to win it politically. They have come and march on him and threaten him. And Philippa comes out of that. But you know what brings Philippa back and everybody back? In 18... Sorry, I just mentioned one thing. I have to start... Excuse me here. You know, sometimes in life when, when everything's going fine and then you get difficulties, not only him, the whole denomination into problems. Because Nib dies in, in 1845. Berchel dies the beginning of 1846. Philip for Nib and Virgil are the stars, not only of the Baptist, of the missionary thing, in the, and they are cut down in, in you know, at the end of 1950, Tinson dies. Are you understanding that? And he has to face the death of his close friend. But then, in 1850, 51, comes a thing called the cholera pandemic. Okay? You know what that means. And Filippo is not taking care of himself. He's, he's the leader of the things to, with the government to, to sanitize Spanish town, to stop the, the, the spread of the disease. He's there visiting everybody who is falling and, and, and bringing salt and care and provisions and it brings back Philippo, the crisis of the pandemic brings back Philippo and restores his soul Philippo the people's representative in the center of planter power after the pandemic and after Morant Bay becomes the confidant of governors in the crown colony period. Because you see, he has proven right about these people. You know what, can you imagine? We're talking and singing about freedom. Can you imagine a set of people who would give up freedom so that they may retain their control? That's what this is, the assembly did, you know, some greedy people, the exploiters of the people, they gave up power rather than, <laughs> and the British government was complicit in it. But Philippo turned right. So you know where he is now. Philippo is in Spanish town, the capital of the country. He, is, he has been living here for close to 40 years. He's an author. He not only wrote about Jamaica, you know, he wrote about the United States and Cuba. And, and racism and things there too. So he's a distinguished author. And all of his books sell out. And he's here. So you know that people like Pete, uh, Pete, uh, John Peter Grant, all the Crown Colony Governor, and, and um, Gray, and um, Musgrave, they were always inviting him to King's House and asking his views. And when he was to do it. He was the one to which all the Baptist ministers send their information, and he had the, he had the numbers. So Philippo, the representative of the people that you could rely on, becomes the confidant of government to be the broker. 
Hear me now. Philippa dies, age 81. His wife dies before him. He loves Spanish town. I wouldn't say Philippa loved Jamaica. He loves Spanish town. Never lived, left here. From 15, from 1823, he dies in 18. 79 in Spanish town because when he had to leave the man, some rent <laughs> a cottage just outside the town and he dies there. Philippo was a man who led the whole of Spanish town to hear Governor Smith read the Proclamation of Freedom. 7,000 people, it said the largest march ever. You, people don't recall that. Philippo led and they organized it that he would do it and people lifted him. Hear me. 200 years after he comes, we remember Philippo. Pastor, I am happy. I didn't know this was the first emancipation lecture that you're having in Philippo. I've spoken here several times. But I didn't know. But thank you. And I, I thank you for allowing me to choose the topic. And I thank you that when I did that, you, you found a pine engraver and put something on it. Let me say this to anyone who's a young person. Two are making two appeals and finish. Remember when Philippo decides to be a missionary. And then they place him and he's faithful for all of his life. The last time he visited England, about four years before he died, the people in his hometown never recognized him. We went back to the house and him, <laughs> he was saying goodbye to him. Nobody recognized him over there. He came back to a tumultuous welcome. But in 1894, his son, who had become the doctor, James Cecil Philippo, before that had become the first Jamaican born to be a member of the Privy Council and, and become the president of the Privy, because he became his legal arm. Whenever they take out any action, Cecil Philippo was the one who did the legal work. And there, you, I, I hope you have heard of a, of, a, of a man named Dr. Reverend Dr. Robert Love. Have you ever heard of him? Well, let me tell you. Love was a microman in Bahamas. Black Bahamian go to a micro school, leaves the Bahamas, goes to the United States, become an Anglican priest, also goes to United, in the United States, become a medical doctor, graduating 19th out of, of about 150. So he's both a medical doctor and an Anglican priest with a silver tongue. He goes to Haiti because he believes that if he's to make a difference, he can do it there because they are independent. And he goes to Haiti. He gets expelled because Haiti has another of its revolutions. And he lands in in, in, in Kingston in 1890. And he finds the Baptists have lost some of their fervor and the missionaries have lost some. So, you know, Philippa wants to re-engage. He noticed that black men are not, are not offering themselves as candidates. He noticed that black people are not voting. You know what he does? In 1894, he establishes, listen to this, Philippa dies in, in 1879. His son dies in about 1893. In 1894, Robert Love, the silver tongue orator, establishes the Philippa Nib Birchell Memorial Fund 
with branches in every parish of Jamaica. And he uses the work of Philippo and Nib, the Anglican preacher, and Virgil, to re-energize. And he gets the first black man to be elected to the Legislative Council. Dixon was his name. And the second one named Smite. And from that surge, he brings back. But more than that, it is the work of love that brings the national club that pledges to come to independence in 1809, to its, in 1909, to which Marcus Garvey is the secretary in 1910. He influences every one of the major persons at the beginning of the 20th century who leads Jamaica to independence. More than that, when, when Robert Love does that, in 1898, Thomas Gordon Somers is elected the first black pastor of Philippo of, of First Baptist Church. You hear me? And you know of Gordon Somers. If you're Baptist, you don't know Gordon Somers Society. You don't know nothing. In other words, the legacy of Philippo goes far beyond. Passageport, now Portmore, Kitson Town, Heartlands, Sligoville, you go right around. I also say to all of you young people, young people, don't listen to all of this. That it is only money that counts. That life is only important in what you get and what you have. All belongs to God. Make your choices, not on things but on faith in God, and most of all, the faithfulness of God, who honors us when we don't even know it, and in ways that people might not even remember, but God used us. The life of Philippo demonstrates that. Can we do that again? Yes, Prof Miller, thank you. Thank you for that mind boggling, soul searching, letting us think about where we are, but at the same time looking at the past and the life of Reverend Filippo and what it means for us today. What will our legacy be? We may not be from Spanish Town, but we are from all walks. But Mr. Filippo, he planted himself here, and he made a difference. What will our legacy be? So at this time, we're going to open the, the floor for a few questions to our professor. So the microphone is right beside me on my left. So I'm going to invite those of us who would want to, in our pondering, pose a question or two to Prof for him to further give us some guidance. So I'll invite anyone at this time to come. The mic is open.
to take questions, to, to ask your questions so that Prof can give us some further guidance on what we may have to ask. Anyone? Are we taking questions online as well? Yes, okay, so we're taking questions online as well. You have a question, sis? We're going to be using a roving mic, so. Not really a question, but as I listen, I am having some regrets. If I had any idea of the richness that we would have found here, we might have gotten some more persons out. So I wish if next time there could be a little bit of preparation in terms of what we could expect, because I have a little one who wanted to come. And I thought he might not want to sit through a lecture, but this was so arousing and educational. I think, I just ask, is it being recorded? I hope it was recorded. So we're on YouTube, we are online, so the it will be there for posterity. Yes, second question. Thank you. So if Reverend Filippo was, as you said, a critic of the plantocracy, for lack of a better term, and was a thorn in the side of the establishment, and given how the Baptist polity, as I understand it, I'm a Roman Catholic, but so I'm on the outside looking in, is a free church and a free state. What was his relationship to the established Anglicans on this island? Filippo was Catholic in the general sense of the word of embracing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he was really Baptist when it came on to the matter of the separation of church and state. He believed, for example, that the only way that education could be offered, and this is one of the areas he made the greatest contribution, is in partnership. He believed that the state could not be trusted with developing the mindset of the people because it would want to impose their views. And he didn't believe any sect, including the Baptists, should have control over that because it would be sectarian. So he was not in favor of the Anglican church. He, one of the great, <laughs> one of the great triumphs of Filippo is that he was instrumental in getting the Anglican church disestablished. Because you say, I give it to you in, in actual fact, and it was not on the grounds of d doctrine, is what was that the, the church, the, Angl the state took care of all the churches, the buildings, and the thing to the tune of 40,000 pounds a year. And in his view, and it worked, that 40,000 could do far, and when you think of 40,000 at the time, it was more than 10% of the budget, you understand? And therefore he thought, and, and John Peter Grant took his advice and disestablished the Anglican church, and he didn't do it in any confrontation. In fact, the Anglican church trick itself. Because they used to give them an authorization. This is parliamentary thing now. I don't want to get too much in the weeds. My wife will object to me getting too much in the weeds. But they used to get an authorization for every 14 years. <laughs> so when they had some problems in the 1850s, they extended it prematurely so that it ended in 1869. And when it came up, all that John Peter Grant did was not renew it. And the bishop was told, 
we're not going to serve, we're not going to pay your salaries, the salaries of all the, the priests. We're not going to maintain all of your churches. And then the Anglican Church quickly made a sin of them say, I'm not accepting that either. Because all of the, th the things belong to the state. And you're going to have to make some rules that are fair. <laughs> And that is how it happened. And, 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 and Philippo was, the, the whole Baptist church worked for it, but he, he became, the, as I said, a confidant. So he had the view that the only way that education could work was that with, on three bases. One, government being a partner. Churches being, a, being partners. And the conscience clause, which did not allow any denomination to its impose and allow teachers and students to opt out of the teaching. But he didn't have a contentious relationship with Anglican priests and Catholic priests. And so he was very, he, he was very, he was a very cordial person. But he had strong views. And by the way, I, 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 I thank you, for, I thank the comment about many more people, but I have a feeling that, that God works in mysterious ways. The people who needed to hear it have heard. The people who are interested will go view. The Lord will use it as he chooses. It has never bothered me the size of any. And let me tell you, I've seen in my own lifetime, I won't name the churches out of any embarrassment. I remember one church, we took it on as a project. And in the night services, there were two adults and a whole heap of children. I never forget those two adults. And for years, we just go with those. And today, that church is a thriving church. Only God could do that. So, I know it sounds foolish. I know it sounds stupid. I am no, I'm just a layman. But the God that I know is a living God. He is not the God of the past. As I said this morning, I had stopped for over 20 years, probably 30, speaking twice in one day. Stop doing it. I'm too nervous. It takes too much out. I have never come to a lecture more unprepared. You see me using this is because in changing the clothes, I didn't bother pick up an handkerchief. I, I can know that my, my wife is going to scold me for it. You understand? I didn't know I could still do it 